to our podcast today on, on planning for your MBA applications. Uh, if you're here, you're here because you want to, uh, you're looking to apply in the coming, you know, coming year, next couple of years, and you're thinking to yourself, it's a big process, how do I, how do I get there? So the purpose of today's webinar is all about how to plan and what you should be thinking about as you try to figure out how to hit those deadlines. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about who we are, who's, on, who's, who's the voice behind the curtain, if you will, uh, when you should apply. We'll talk about kind of the structure. Uh, we'll talk about some confusing statements that we get a lot. Um, we'll talk about where you should start. We'll talk about kind of the in the weeds plan. Uh, and then we'll end with, uh, with a Q&A. And so for everyone on the line right now, uh, first of all, thank you for joining. But secondly, you're on mute. And, and when we get to the Q&A component, there's a questions uh, portion uh, on the right-hand side uh, when you logged in. And you can type in a question. And at the end, I'll pull them all up and I'll kind of go through them. So who are we? More specifically, who am I? I'm Bavik. I'm the managing partner here at Critical Square. And who are we? Well, we're an admissions consulting firm uh, that's really focused uh, on stories. Uh, and we've worked with clients uh, throughout uh, throughout the application lifecycle, from folks who needed you know needed a hand every step of the way to folks who needed a hand kind of at the in the last mile. Uh, every applicant was different, but but how we approach the client and how we approach their application has never changed. Right? It's always a blank sheet of paper, and it's always story first. So, you know, I won't make this too salesy. Uh, we'll get straight into the meat of things. Uh, for those who are on, on the webinar, and, and hopefully those who are viewing this as a recording later, but who uh, are seeing this before May 15th, I wanted to, to let you know that our early bird for round one applications goes through May 15th. So whether you feel super confused about the process or you're just raring and ready to go. Uh, we have different solutions and packages and, and, and services that are out there and you know we don't offer discounts too often but you know through through May 15th it's 10% off everything. So definitely check that out. But enough about us, enough enough salesy uh, gibberish. Let's talk about uh, when you should apply in the application process. So at a very high level, uh, the application process is very much like uh, the seats on the bus. And so you, you have to wonder a little bit about how do you get one of those seats and, and how do they get filled up, right? I mean, if you, uh, if you went to school in the U.S. and you had to wait in the mornings for the school bus to come, sometimes there were a lot of kids already on it depending on when you got on. Sometimes there weren't a lot of kids on it when you got on. Uh, and the application process is very much, uh, very much similar, right? Depending on when you get on the bus, more or less, you know, more or fewer seats will be available. And so it's important to think about your selectivity and your ability to find a seat uh, was always better when the bus was emptier, right? And, and generally speaking, as you look at the application process, this is when we really start talking about when is the right time to apply. Uh, because schools, as they try to fill this proverbial bus, uh, are really looking to uh, make sure it's filled with the right people and it's filled at the right time. And these people are going to stay on the bus, right? Yield. So what is the high level uh, you know, component around uh, when uh, application deadlines are? Well, we're tied to the academic calendar here. Right? So we start in August and we go through July, so if this looks a little uh, wonky, that's why. Uh, but starting in August is really when early round deadlines open up. And, and this one goes through September. It can go through October uh, for certain programs. Uh, but round one is kind of that hallmark round. This is when the majority of people apply. This is when all the buzz happens and people are knee deep in their application essays. Round one goes from about September through October-ish. And, and certain schools have mis, you know, uh, nominal round uh, changes. And so it's sometimes difficult to say, you know, for example, UNC Keenan Flagler has different rounds at different times, but 98% of the time this is what applies. Uh, Harvard uh, always kicks things off 
in, in early September. So as you go through September and October, that's round one. There's a bit of a lull in November. There are some deadlines, but there's a bit of a lull. Uh, and, and round two really picks up speed, uh, steam in, in December and January. So uh, the problem here is, uh, is this. Round one, you've applied sometime in September or October. By the time you hear back, it's mid-ish December, right? Maybe early December to mid-December. A lot of times they like December 19th. Um, the problem with that is uh, round two deadlines, your backup rounds, are two or three weeks away. Those deadlines are two or three weeks away, and you just received news. So the problem with this is if, you're, if you have a multi-round strategy, your latter round will have already had to have kicked off maybe in that October, very early November stage. Otherwise, you're just going to run out of time, right? And how nice of them. When everyone else is celebrating and, and drinking eggnog, uh, you can be working on, uh, on your application essays because who doesn't want to do that uh, to ring in the new year, right? So that's when, that's when round two is. Uh, once again, a bit of a lull in February, and then round three uh, hit, you know, kicks off right around the March, April time frame, and then round four, uh, a little bit later. Some schools have round five, round six, but some don't. Um, and that's more school specific at that point. Now, at the bottom of the slide, there's a little thing I've written, uh, and it says, beware of early decision rounds. They're not everything they appear to be. So let's talk about this for a second, because uh, if there is uh, a misconception that comes up year after year after year, it's this one. Well, I really love this school, so I'm going to apply as soon as humanly possible. And then uh, they, they forget that the school does not exist to simply give them a degree, right? The school exists to pull in the, the best people, the very best talent. Early decision is, a, is in the school's best interest, not in the applicant's best interest. Think about it. Um, Think about it as, as, a, as, a, as a draft, right? It's an ability for the school to lock down top talent uh, immediately, right? Let's say you really wanted to go to Columbia. You were doing early decision. It was going to be awesome. And you're a pretty decent candidate. You, maybe you were a consultant or a banker, good GMAT score, decent GPA, you know, nothing spectacular. But nothing bad either. You're just a good candidate, um, you know. And, and Columbia is a pretty good school for you. If Columbia looks at that application and they say, "Well, look, this applicant's pretty good. They're not the best, but they're pretty good. Uh, I wonder if there will be better applicants later." And now, all of a sudden, you found yourself in a position where either you'll be dinged, which is mildly unlikely, or you'll find yourself on the wait list, which is far more common, right? But let's say you were an amazing candidate. You just blew the socks off the admissions committee. They'd be like, hey, yeah, absolutely. Let's let this person in right now. Let's lock them in with a $6,000 deposit. And that's great. Now we've got this amazing person in our, our next year's class. But they're not going to give up a C simply because you're very passionate about the school. Being passionate about the school is great, but only if you're awesome, right? So early decision. Uh, can sometimes work against you. And that's something to keep in mind. So what are some common application strategies? Well, on this slide, I've listed three. Uh, there are obviously more. There are an infinite combination. But these are the three most common that we see. The first one, the berserker, right? All in, no safeties, no aligned. Round one, I'm applying to schools I don't have a chance at or I have a very low chance at. Screw it, this is what I want to do. And then in round two, maybe they add in a few more aligned, but by then they're already kind of behind the eight ball potentially. And in round three, they may be in a position where they're having to really you know, really dig deep uh, and apply in, in less optimal rounds to safety programs because they haven't been able to convert. Now, I'm not saying everyone who uses this berserker strategy isn't successful in round, round one. Some people are, right? We have clients every year who come to us and say, look, if I'm not going top five, I'm not going to business school. And then for them, it's pretty much the berserker strategy and only in round one. That's, that's all they're doing. Um, but it can lead to some restless nights, some heartburn, and maybe mass panic uh, down the road, right, depending on how the, the, 
the success goes. More common is the balanced approach. These are individuals who uh, aren't looking to have a multi-round approach. They're looking to have one round, put in, uh, you know, put in all of their applications, do it in a balanced way, right? Some stretch, some aligned, some safety. Um, and chances are, by the end of that, they have uh, hopefully at least one, but probably more than one school to choose from. Right? And it's, it's a very uh, deliberate strategy because you're saying, look, I'm going to spread myself a bit thinner across these, these three categories of types of schools, but I'm going to cover the entire gamut so that I know, uh, you know, I, I know coming out of round one that there's a very good chance that I'm going to get it. Um, and you could use the same strategy for round two, right? You don't have to do it all in round one. You, you could do it in round two. Should you do it in round three? No, because you know, by the time you get to a round three, um, uh, you know, there aren't very many seats left on the bus. And, and that's something I, I forgot to mention uh, in the previous slide, which is uh, round one and round two are when the majority, the vast majority of, of seats are filled on this, on this proverbial bus. And so when you apply in round three or round four, you got to be awesome. You got to be different. You got to add value in some crazy cool way, because if you don't, then they might already have someone like you and they don't need to replicate that. So that's so so going back, that's the balanced approach. It's often the right strategy for the wide majority of applicants, but it can be customized, right? Maybe you're gonna do stretch and aligned and maybe one safety in round one and maybe some in round two. And if you get into the round one schools, you're gonna pull the plug on round two's applications. There are there are a million different ways to slice this, right? Uh, and lastly, you have kind of the safety, the over-conservative approach. No stretch schools, only aligned, only safety, but similar to the balance uh, in a round, right? You want to be done in a round. We generally don't advocate for the safety. A and here's why. It can sometimes lead an applicant to pass up on a better school. The, the, the thing we always tell our clients is, look, you only do, you only get your MBA once. You only do this once. Try. The worst that can happen is that the school says no, but let the school say no. Don't say no on their behalf, right? Don't 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 psych yourself out and say, well, I could I could never get into this uh, into this program, uh, so I'm just not even going to try. Give it a shot, see what happens. Which is why the balance can sometimes be so great, uh, because then you're not laying in bed at night going, well, I got into this school, but could I've gotten into an even better one? So those are some of the more common application strategies and, 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 and how you think about your personal application strategy is going to be contingent on not just where you want to apply, but also things like, well, what's your, what's your schedule look like? Do you have any vacations coming up? How does work factor into this, right? So for example, maybe at your end is really busy for you guys, and in which case round two could be a disaster. Right, right when you're supposed to be working on all these applications around two, you, you've got to be closing books and, and doing inventory. And so business cycles are important to consider as well. So think about not only when you're applying, uh, but, but where you're applying as well. And, and match those two together to come up with a, a solution and a strategy that makes sense for you, that sets you up for success. Right. So. What are some confusing statements we hear uh, a lot? And, and these are a collection of two or three of them uh, that we hear uh, from folks looking to apply, uh, and they come up every time. And, and statistically speaking, some of you uh, listening to this webinar right now probably, probably said one of these uh, either to somebody else or to yourself at some point. So what's the first one? All right. Well, I haven't taken the GMAT yet. But on the mock exams, I'm scoring a 720 or so, so I think we should go ahead and get started. I cannot stress this enough. Um, mock exam scores do not count. They are not actionable. They are not reliable. They simply cannot be used. Uh, and, and every year, we have people who, who talk to us and say, hey, well, what kind of school should I apply to? Or, or let's go ahead and get started. Uh, oh, well, what's your GMAT? Oh, I haven't taken that yet. No, right? If you're going to be applying to G, uh, you know, business schools, the GMAT is one of the first things you have to do. 
in, in generally speaking, these mock exams uh, are directional at best, and they are uh, disastrous at worst. So uh, using some kind of loose percentages, but hopefully the, the, the gravity of them gives you an idea. Of the people who've made this statement to us, 80 to 90 percent of them have done worse on the actual day of the test. 80 to 90 percent of them. Uh, every now and then, we get a few people who do about the same. I thought I was going to get a 720, I got a 720. And every now and then, maybe 5 percent of the time or so, uh, we hear about people who, you know, who were scoring 650s on the mock exams and crushed it the day of, right? They thought they were going to walk out with a 650, they walk out with a 750, boom, end of story, they did awesome. That's really rare. 80 to 90 percent of the time, like I said, it doesn't go as well. And that's because the GMAT experience is entirely different, it, right? You're not taking this test at a Starbucks, you're taking this test in a room, in a little cubicle, with giant headphones on your head, you're stressing out. If you're a poor test taker, you've got a lot of anxiety. If you haven't taken the GMATs, you can't start your applications. Because, you know, let's say you're planning on a 720 and you get a 650, well now all of your schools could be potentially stretch schools or unrealistic. Or if you're planning on a 650 and you get a 750, well now a lot more schools are in range that you should be trying for. And so it's very difficult uh, to pick schools, to figure out what your strategy is, to figure out what kind of academics you're dealing with, what kind of gaps you need to fill in, if you don't have your GMAT score, right? So this is one we hear a lot. What else? I have, and yeah, I absolutely have to start business school this coming year. Uh, I 100% I have to convert. So I'm only applying to Harvard and Stanford. All right, so you know, one of the things we tell our clients to imagine is they're standing in front of a machine and they've got two levers. On one hand, they can be aggressive, and on the other hand, they can convert. If you try to convert, you, can, you, you have to be a bit less aggressive, and vice versa. Right? The more aggressive you are, your conversion chances go, go down. For some people, for, for some reason, most people think they can pull on both levers at once. It doesn't work that way, right? If you only apply to Harvard and Stanford, your chances for converting are, are minuscule, unless you're an amazing applicant. But for, for most average applicants, I mean, it's probably not going to happen. And, and so uh, it can make it very difficult to have conversations um, around school selection, or, or kind of hedging your risk within the portfolio, etc. When uh, you know, if you haven't had an honest conversation about you know with yourself about what are your goals, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and then honestly looking at those together and saying here are the schools that I should be applying to, and that's where people like us come into play, right? We can help you with that conversation, right? Whether it's through a free consultation or through our school selection, whatever, we can help you with that. Um, but you have to be honest with yourself about kind of how you approach this process. And lastly, <laughs> this one's always great, and, and I literally got this one uh, uh, yesterday on a free consultation. Uh, what can I do to improve my profile in the next two or three months before my applications are due? Uh, pretty much nothing, right? Uh, successful applications to uh, the top business schools weren't made in months. They've been in motion for years. Um, think about uh, think about a, a space launch. You're going to the moon, right? You're in the rocket. You've been working on this rocket for for years. You've built this rocket. It's an amazing rocket. Um, you've done all the calculations. You know exactly what time of the day and you know where the Earth has to be. And you've done all the calculations. You've got this you know, this massive plan. Uh, so then you 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 know you count down. You launch. Right, it's great. You time every burner, uh, every burn precisely. First, second, third stage, you're great. Now you're in space. You're out of our atmosphere. You're heading towards the moon. As you get closer and closer to the moon, uh, you can make slight adjustments, like slight course corrections. You know, maybe maybe one of your calculations was a little bit off, but it's okay. No big deal. We'll burn a little bit. Boom, we're we're back on track. But if you're going to miss the moon hundreds of thousands of miles, and you're asking, oh, well, can't we just burn a bit extra and, and, and get back onto track? No, you can't, 
right? So if you think about this analogy from kind of your, your life, right? Everything you do, you know, kind of on earth preparing for this launch is, is high school and, and college and involvement activities while you were in school. And then you, you launch, right? You launch your career. You get your job. Maybe you get a promotion. Maybe you get another job. These are big monumental chunks in your career that you're in, in decisions that you're making and you're trying to get yourself lined up for that move. But if you're going to miss two to three months out, there isn't a lot you can do, right? Maybe you can take a new project on at work or find a new initiative for one of the involvement activities that you have on your resume, uh, you know, or to kind of you know, add a bit of spice or maybe find a new impactful bullet, but can you make massive changes, right? If you haven't been involved at all for four years, can you just go join a new club or, or organization? No, you can't because it's going to look awkward, right? So successful applications have been years in the making. So when we get questions like this, uh, it always kind of you know, sets off flags in our head because it, it's a concerning component. So with that said, well, where do you start, right? You're thinking about applying, where do you start? Well, there are three basic stages uh, to an application process. The basics, the required prep work, if you will, and then the actual application, right? Most of you will, will be thinking, well, I'm applying to, uh, to business school, so I'm just going to do the actual application. No, there are, there are two stages that come before that. So about 8 to 12 to 24 months, depending, before your application deadlines or when you're looking to submit, take the GMAT. We talked about this before. Get it out of the way. They're good for five years. Crush them. Don't leave that hanging over your head while you go through the application process. Build an alternative transcript. If you had bad grades or you didn't have a lot of quantitative coursework in, in, in undergrad, um, build, you know, take some classes. It takes time, right? These classes aren't Coursera certificate courses, they take 10 weeks, right? The UCLA extension, the Berkeley extension, they take time. And if you're gonna, if you have to take two or three or four of them, that's a lot of months right there. So think, think in advance. Um, and know yourself, your goals and your needs. They don't have to, I'm not talking about career goals you talk about in your application. I'm talking about know if you need to go this year. Know if you just want to go in the next few years. It'll determine how aggressive you can be. It'll determine what kind of schools Talk, you know, think about your needs personally and professionally. It will help you think through schools at a very high level. Four to seven months before deadline, so we're kind of coming up on the, the latter half of that window right now. It's, it's April. Um, visit your schools and programs. Schools are still in session right now, so go visit. Talk to students. Talk to alumni. And, and research your goals. And if you're trying to make a career transition, talk to people who are in that career right now. Go find out what they're thinking. Go find out what they find valuable. But this is the time, the required prep work, that four to seven months before your deadlines, is the perfect time to have these conversations, to invest the time in the process. And then the actual application itself. This is, once again, uh, we're going to go into this in a bit more depth in the next slide, but the actual application takes three to four months, right? Depending on kind of what strategy you're you're selecting, if you're choosing this this the, the balanced approach, um, you could be putting in anywhere between four and six applications. And more importantly, these essays, these applications, these stories, these strategies, they take time, they take iteration, they take reflection. All of those things uh, don't happen overnight. Right, you should you should have time in your schedule to, to put away an essay for a week, not look at it again, and then go look at it, pull it off the shelf, dust it off, and go, oh my God, this what was I writing here, right? Or this is confusing to me, or I've had an amazing idea on how to make this even better. But you can't put an application on the shelf for a week if you started working on that application three weeks before deadlines. Right? So if you plan out the appropriate amount of time, you can really put time and effort and, and a bit of care into this process. So what, you know, what should you be doing? You should be crafting your story. You should be preparing and supporting your recommenders. And you should be actually de developing that perfect application packet. So what's the plan? Right? Now, we've talked about this application at a very high level. What's the plan? How should you be structuring it? Well, when we work with our clients, we work with them uh, we look at the application process in two halves, right? The first half, uh, 
is is nothing that you thought is is not what you're thinking of, right? You're probably thinking about oh I got to do my resume, I got to do some essays, I got to do that online application, boom boom boom, that's my application. No, we don't touch that till the second half of the process with our clients. The first half is all strategy and story and prep. And so I, I'd suggest everyone listening to this webinar to do it the same way, right? Select your schools. And if you've done your prep work, right, the, uh, the, the four to seven months before, if you've been really thinking about schools and visiting them and talking to people, et cetera, school selection should have been an evolving thought process. Think about your story framework. What are you going to tell these schools? Is your story going to be the same for every school? Is it going to be customized in some way? What's the game plan? Put it down on paper, right? I am on day one. On day 20, I'm going to have this done. By day 30, I'm going to have this done. If you put it down on paper, you have to hold yourself accountable. Right? And so it's a powerful tool. We do it with our clients. We suggest you do it with yourself as well. Hold yourself accountable. Otherwise, these deadlines can be very fungible. And next thing you know, you're behind schedule because work got busy or you took an unexpected trip, you know, whatever. So, so, so make, make sure you're very on track uh, throughout the process. Select your recommenders. Talk to people. Um, you know, see if they'll support you. Recommender selection is not the same as recommender conversations. Right? Recommender conversations and recommender prep go together. So you obviously, you've, you've now selected your recommenders. They've said, yes, we'll do it for you. Now you have to put together a, a rec prep pack to talk about the themes and the stories and what you're going to be communicating. And then you need to sit down with these people and be like, here's, here's how I need you to kind of go through this process. Here's how I can help you and, and, and walk them through, the, you know, walk them through the content. Don't just leave them to their own devices. Once the recommendations are up and running, now you can worry about the second half. Now talk about your resume, essay brainstorm, uh, you know, write and edit those, those essays. Right. This is a very iterative process, as I mentioned. Recommendation review. You know, every now and then, clients uh, we understand have to write their own recommendations. Either the person they're they're asking is too busy or just doesn't care. We always push back. Right. Whenever possible, have your recommender write the recommendation. But that doesn't mean you can't provide feedback. Um, not edits, but comments and feedback. Right. You want to stay ethical about this process. Um, to say, hey, I like this story. Could we do something about this? Or, hey, you remember when we did this you know, project? I had done X. Could you incorporate that? Right? You can you can provide some feedback. Have touch points with your recommenders. Um, you know, to make sure that they're on track. Right? <laughs> Recommend the last thing you want is a recommender who is procrastinating uh, and and trying to slap the recommendation together two days before the deadline because they forgot about it. So touch base with them every two to three or four weeks, depending on when you start, so that they understand that you are on top of it. Um, the online application itself. Don't shove this to the last moment. Right? Work on this concurrently. It has to be a part of your story. Uh, and then obviously devote some time, allocate some time uh, to finalizing that application. Going through every resume or every essay, every you know, the resume, the online application to make sure Everything is in order. The last thing you want is to be tripped up by something small. So with that said, we'll move to the, the Q&A. I've seen um, some, some great questions coming through. So if you give me a second, I'm going to pull them out. And, uh, and then we'll just we'll, we'll go through them one at a time. And hopefully, uh, there'll be some great ones. So <laughs> this, is a good, this is a good question. How important is the GMAT score in the entire application? Um, and by your name, I'm assuming you are Indian. Um, incredibly important. Very, 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 very important. Um, you know, I think a lot of times it's common uh, for individuals to think, hey, you know, my GMAT's not great, but I'm, I'm pretty unique. I'm pretty different. The schools will love it. Don't worry about it. Uh, my GMAT's not a big concern. Okay, now the problem with that though is it's the only apples to apples comparison that they have, right? And uh, it, I mean, say what you will about the exam, it is a predictive exam in terms of your performance and your aptitude, right? And it affects rankings, right? Let's just, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. The average, the median GMAT for a school affects their rankings. So 
if you're going to if you're going to provide them with an application where the GMAT score is below the median for your applicant pool, and that's a very important phrase, your applicant pool, right? So obviously, let's say the median GMAT is 700, but if you're Indian or Asian, maybe that's closer to a 720 or 730. If it's below the median for your applicant pool, you have to be bringing something to the table that is unique and interesting to the school, right? You have to compensate somehow. So if you're not, if you don't have a spectacular profile in some other way, then the GMAT could very easily hold you out. Um, all right, wow, you guys are sending in some good questions. Uh, what about the EMBA? Uh, that's a wonderful question, and uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention this earlier. EMBAs, uh, and, and, and specifically, uh, or, or alternatively, EWMBAs, so the evening and weekend programs at, at, certain, at certain schools, uh, follow a, generally speaking, a biannual or quarterly process. Um, so if you're going to an evening or a weekend program, um, you know, for example, Booth, depending on the year, we'll have somewhere between two and three deadlines for different start dates. Um, generally speaking, they, they time them with their academic calendar. So there's one in January, there's one in May. Um, for EMBA programs, depending on when they have classes starting, is generally a good indication of when they'll actually have uh, those deadlines. Um, but uh, that said, the timeline that I mentioned above in terms of what you should be doing, when you should be doing it, um, and depending on how many EMBA or EWMBA programs you're applying to, can only marginally shrink, right? I mean, you may have fewer options that you're applying to, but you should still put in the time and, 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 and definitely take this, uh, take this process, um, you know, with, with a, sense of, uh, a sense of seriousness. So here's another question. Um, <laughs> I love uh, I love how uh, no matter what webinar we have, uh, questions sometimes uh, always devolve into GMAT. So is there a large amount of variance between the average GMAT score of a school versus the average GMAT score for Asian applicants? Uh, yes, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 points uh, on average. Um, to give you an idea, if you look at Kelly um, in Indiana. Uh, their median GMAT somewhere in the 660, 670 range. Uh, the median GMAT for Indians, 700. Any other school in the top 10 that's you know right around a 720, the median GMATs for them for Asian applicants, closer to 740 or 750. Um, so yes, 100% higher. Um, okay, so here's a here's a great question uh, about kind of uh, the involvement. Um, do universities look at extracurricular activities like participating in local sporting events, treks, etc.? And if so, how important are these activities? Um, they do. Of course, they do. They're a part of your life. Um, they want to see what you're like when you leave work, right? Business school is a community. People are involved. People do things. So if you left work and you went home and you watched, you binge watched Netflix, then chances are when you get to business school, you may not be super involved either. Right? That's one concern. Another thing is they want to figure out what makes you tick, right? Maybe you feel really passionately about group sports. And so no matter what season it is, you are part of a, a league, right? So if you're not working, you're playing sports. Um, that tells us something about you, right? It's, a, it's an interesting passion. It's a very team-based, collaborative uh, culture, and it, it, you can weave a story around that. And maybe if you played a lot of league sports and then you volunteer for some children's league sports, you have a kind of a, a giving back component to it as well. So, you know, for for some applicants, a, a, a small minority of applicants who have no involvement, um, it can be disastrous, right? Because you don't want it to be a blank. Uh, for some, uh, another minority of clients, their involvement is so amazing that it puts everyone else to shame. But for the majority of applicants, they find themselves somewhere in the middle. And you really just want to be able to put a good story around it. Um, okay, so in GMAT scores, will an applicant be judged by quant and verbal scores separately? Uh, yes, um, obviously the overall score is what gets reported, but they give you breakouts because it provides more data points. So yes, they look at both. Um, 
Okay. Um, that's a fragment of the question. Um, oh, you're very welcome. Somebody said thanks. Um, all right, so um, okay, so this individual uh, seems like he's a couple of years away from, or Shiri, sorry, is a couple of years away from applying, uh, and they said, well, I was at IIT MNC for two years, but left it to pursue a venture with a friend in fashion retail. It didn't work out well, and I quit after a year. Currently, I'm unemployed. What would you recommend me do to do now? Um, or sorry, he was in an, an IT, uh, MNC, sorry, not IIT. Um, never be unemployed, right? Extensive gaps in your resume can be uh, significant flags. Um, by the way, if anyone on this webinar or anyone listening to this webinar is considering quitting their job to prepare for uh, their GMAT, uh, don't. Don't don't ever do that, right? If a banker can take a GMAT and score 750 while they're working 80-hour weeks, you can figure it out. Um, so to this particular question, get a job, but make sure that job fits your story, right? So obviously you didn't like what you were doing at this IT firm. You went into fashion retail. It seems like you're interested in that field. So see if you can get a job in that field, right? Maybe your startup didn't go well, but you did. Look, you made a very brave decision. You gave it a shot, right? I don't think anyone reading that will, will, will you know, I think everyone can respect that. But if you go back into an IT firm, then this will have been for nothing. So capitalize on the fact that you've uh, broken form and gotten some momentum. It, it doesn't matter that the firm wasn't successful. You still have momentum. Um, and really see what else is out there. See, you know, maybe if this is a, an industry that you're really passionate about, try to get a job in that industry. And then you can put a story together uh, more easily when you do apply. Um, this individual asks, how do, how do I choose my schools? So we talked a lot about uh, research. We talked a lot about chatting with people. We talked about visiting schools or if you're abroad, visiting their events. Uh, you know, on our website, we have uh, a page dedicated to things you should consider when choosing schools. And we also have detailed schools, uh, free school proof, uh, profiles on the top 20 programs out there. Um, it's a difficult question to answer on a webinar. It, it's a dynamic conversation, right? Um, things that are important to you may not be important to others and, and vice versa. And so how you choose a school really starts at the core with what's important to you, right? Beyond brand and network. Right? Network is a nebulous term. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that one anymore. But beyond just brand and network and jobs, what is important to you? What, what do you want to get out of this experience? Um, all right, so um, all right, so okay, for a reapplicant, what is the game plan you guys follow, especially if I'd like to reapply to the same schools? Uh, reapplicant strategies, um, and this is a wonderful question. Reapplicant strategies always start with what you sent in before, because reapplicant strategies are a delta strategy. What has changed? What did you not communicate? Right. What we look for, preferably in a remarketing or a reapplicant strategy, rather, is hopefully an individual who not only had a couple of things that they could fix, but also did a poor job in communicating um, either their their research or their goals or their passions, um, because those you can work on. Right. If, however, the person had you know simply been reaching too high then your chances can go down. But it always starts with what did you apply with and what did you leave out and what has changed? Because with most other individuals who aren't reapplicants who are going through this application process, we have all the jigsaw puzzles on the, the pieces on the on the table, right? We can pick and choose and figure out what we want to do. With reapplicants, a lot of those pieces have already been played. And so we're really kind of looking for that white space in your application where we can put in additional uh, additional work to really help convert this time around um, you know and, and kind of assuage the concerns that the admissions committee may have had um, oh this is a great one um, this person's asking about kind of uh, 
doing research and talking to people and alumni, how do you get leads and contacts of alumni apart from LinkedIn and college websites? Um, those are by far the two best. Um, if there are uh, particular firms that you're interested in where you know an alumnus works, um, let's say, uh, you know, that some, some publicity has come about, you can try to find it that way. A, a really great way that I think a lot of people forget about, ask folks, right? So let's say you're really interested in, in consulting and you talk to somebody in the consulting club uh, at a school. Um, ask them, like, hey, do you know anybody who's graduated in the last couple of years who's working at firm X, Y, or Z that I could talk to? Right? And then you talk to that person. And be like, hey, this was a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time. I'd love to learn a little bit more about this industry. Do you know anybody who maybe works in that industry? And so it's not just I went on the college website, I went on LinkedIn, and I found a list of 100 people I want to talk to. No, it, it's here's the starting list, and then my research is going to go organically from there. Um, all right. Okay, does it improve my chances if, I have a, if I've started my own startup but I didn't do it full time? That's a really difficult question to answer, right? The, the reason I'm, I'm attempting to answer it is because a lot of times people will ask questions like this without knowing the, the full details. It's difficult, right? If that startup is in a, uh, an industry that you're passionate about, then that's great. If that startup is, um, you know, let's say a nonprofit and it's successful, then that's great. Right? As long as the startup helps your story, then the startup is always good. And it doesn't, you don't have to do it full time, right? People have side, side startups all the time. Um, let's see. Um, ah, here's, a, here's a great one around kind of academics and, and alternative. Do certificate courses from Coursera really matter, especially the paid ones? Um, nah. Yes and no. Right. It's good that you've done them. If it helps you uh, with your story, then it's great. But is it? Are, are they going to help you build an alternative transcript? Probably not. Right. For an alternative transcript, you really need courses. Um, however, a lot of schools, Harvard, a lot of a lot of programs out there are asking which Coursera's. Uh, you know, if you have taken any Coursera classes, um, because they want to know, right? They want if you've been pursuing knowledge. Pursuit. The pursuit of knowledge is never a bad thing, but. Uh, depending on what you're using it for. If you're showing it, if you're showcasing passion, awesome. If you're trying to fill in, uh, you know, red flags on your transcript or your low GMAT, then probably not. Um, let's see. Um, oh, this is a great question, actually. Should I start researching and planning which schools to apply to while preparing for the GMAT or only after uh, I have my score in hand? That's, uh, that's, that's a fantastic question. That's the absolute right way to think about it. The school selection process is, is a tiered approach, right? Um, you know, you start, tier one, you start with all of the schools that are out there, um, and then you go to the next level. You're like, well, these aren't in the places I want to be, or these are not ranked highly enough. And so you start making wide cuts. Right, so that's tier two. And now you've got a, a more manageable but still a lengthy list. Um, and then you go apply a few more filters, right? How big is the class size? What kind of uh, teaching method do they have? You know, are they urban? Are they rural? Whatever. And now you've got a more manageable list. Um, but that list will still be kind of across the spectrum. And while you're studying for your GMATs, what I would say is uh, research the programs, talk to people, um, and, and make notes, right? Put together your own kind of selection framework. And then when you have your score in hand, right, then you can go back to this and be like, all right, now these schools above this are stretch and these are aligned and these are safety. And then it's more just segmentation than selection, right? And then you can kind of go a couple of steps further and be like, all right, within, within the aligned schools, these are the two or three that I'm going to target. And one of the things to also keep in mind is after you have your score in hand, you may decide uh, that you want to retake it or that it was so much better than you could have ever hoped for. So you kind of have, you don't want to have selected schools and then have to go revisit the selection, but you want to have buckets 
uh, that you can then go to uh, and classify, right? So you want to be a lot of the way there, but not all the way there. Um, okay, so I know uh, I know the following question is very subjective. Uh, how introspective of you? Uh, but how many schools should one uh, apply to? Is there a minimum safe number? Uh, no, there isn't a minimum safe number. There isn't a, a right answer, right? Um, for example, we had a client last year who only applied to schools in North Carolina. That was two schools, right? She wasn't interested in applying anywhere else. There are certain individuals who, uh, you know, have a bit more time and, and, and want to apply to eight or nine over two rounds. We don't apply. We don't advocate applying to eight or nine in one round. That'd be crazy talk. Um, but generally speaking, most clients apply. From, from our from our numbers, apply to 4.4 schools. Okay, um, now that's that's with clients who work with us kind of on packages. They may tack on some schools here and there, but four to five is generally good. And, but look, if you've only selected stretch schools, then maybe those four or five you're not going to get into anyway. In which case, there is no safe number, right? It it also comes down to how you split your schools out. Um, All right, let's see. Um, is it good to apply to schools even with a GRE score? If you're more comfortable with a GRE, that's fine. Uh, a GMAT is always preferred. Um, but if you've done really well on the GRE, um, go for it. Right? They, most schools will accept it now. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, you know, kind of say no to that idea right off the bat. Um, let's see. For applicants with a low score in undergrad, are alternative transcripts needed alongside a high uh, GMAT quant verbal score? Uh, yeah, they are. Because um, let's say, uh, let, you know what, let's, let, I'll give you an example. Okay, so we had a client uh, last year um, who went to a tier one university, fantastic university, uh, 2.3 GPA abysmal GPA, um, and he had a 730 on his GMAT. Um, so great GMAT, and he came from an underrepresented pool, um, but just those two alone would uh, would not have worked. What he had done was he had taken four UCLA extension courses and rocked them, right? A pluses, A's, just crushed them. And so not only did it show him, you know, showcase that he could do these other classes and he had these skills, but also that he was serious, right? He had invested 40 weeks of class time preparing his alternative transcript. It sent a very powerful signal. And, and, and he got into two top, you know, top fives, both with money, uh, one with almost a full tuition waiver, right? So how you, uh, it, it's not just about grades, right? There's, there's a lot more subtlety here. Um, all right, so let's, uh, Let's find one more question before we kind of wrap this one up. Um, all right. Um, oh, there's another thank you. You're very welcome. I'm glad you guys could join us. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, these are a lot of, uh, sorry, the, the reason I'm kind of looking through it, there's a lot of uh, very profile-specific questions. I'm trying to find uh, more more vague ones. Um, do you really recommend not quitting full-time employment to study for the GMAT? Uh, yes. Yes, I really do. Um, I mean, let's just look at this kind of, uh, kind of from the perspective of the admissions committee, right? So on their desk, they've got your application. They've got a banker and they've got a consultant. The banker's working 100 hours a week, you know, black cars home at 3 a.m. Uh, the consultant's working 80 hours a week, traveling Monday through Thursday. Um, and, and then you. And you've all got, let's say, 730s. But you took two months off to study for this exam. Just how, you know, how would that look, right? And you haven't been developing. You haven't been doing anything at work. If you quit your job, then what are you going to do afterwards? If you've just been on a sabbatical, then that's okay, but you still got this, you know, if you've only got three or four years of work experience, two months is a significant percentage of your professional career. Uh, you know, I, I understand that for everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, the GMAT 
uh, is a personal battle, is a personal struggle, uh, and, and everyone kind of goes through preparing in their same way, in their own way, sorry. Um, but the fact of the matter is other people are doing it without taking time off of work, and that's the, that's the standard. And so if you are taking time off, uh, that puts you at a disadvantage. So uh, with that question, thank you all again for joining. Hopefully this was useful. If you missed any of this or if you want to kind of revisit it, uh, you'll, you'll receive a, a, a recording link to, to kind of have for your viewing pleasure uh, whenever you'd like. But thank you again for joining. Hopefully this was useful. Uh, if any of you uh, need a hand or want to chat, and we have a free consultation, we encourage you to sign up for it. Uh, we'd love to chat with you about kind of when to apply and where to apply and all of those good things. So with that said, thank you again for joining. We really appreciate it and have a great uh, rest of your day.